let's get into how diptera reproduce. If you remember back to the beginning of the semester, we talked about the different types of reproduction. So we're going to be using those terms again. Now, the diptera as an order are holometabolous. So remember, that means a whole um, life cycle. They change from egg to larvae to pupae to adult. So the diptera, just like all holometabolous organisms, start out as eggs. They will hatch into the first of several larval instars. Remember that an instar is a stage of development in that larval stage. They will then pupate and it close into adults. Now, most dipteran females lay eggs. So overall, the diptera will lay eggs. There are a few that do a few things differently, but most lay eggs and they are termed oviparous. So an organism that lays eggs into the environment is an oviparous organism. Now, other diptera will retain those eggs internally until they hatch. So this kind of gives those larvae a leg up, if you think about it. So think about these um, eggs being laid in the environment. That's a pretty dangerous thing. They, they can't run away. They don't have any defenses, really. I mean, they can't bite back. So they're dependent completely on the corian or on the eggshell of that egg to protect them. So there's parasites and predators and, and just life events that can happen to kill those eggs. A larvae, on the other hand, other hand if it's laid in the environment has a little bit of a advantage or, or an advantage over its over the eggs so it can run away it can maybe fight back it can dig down into the soil something like that so that might be a bit of an advantage so those females that retain the eggs internally she still produces them but then they hatch into an early instar larvae she will then lay those into the environment these are called ovoviviparous or larviparous organisms okay so Ovoviviparous or larviparous, retaining those eggs internally and then laying early instar larvae into the environment. Now, a few groups, which we'll learn about a little bit more later in the semester, they retain their developing larvae in their bodies until those larvae are ready to pupate. So they will then either lay down very, very late stage larvae that instantly pupate, or they'll wait until the larva pupates internally and then lay down the pupa casing itself. These are called pupiparous insects or pupiparous organisms. So we got oviparous, ovoviviparous or larviparous and pupiparous, depending on the way that they lay their offspring into the environment. Okay? And so you can go through these and think about the advantages and the disadvantages of these different life uh, choices, right? So oviparous, you can put a lot of eggs into the environment very quickly. You can get back on the market, so to speak, and you can then uh, mate again, lay more eggs. So that's a lot of eggs in the environment very, very quickly. Right? Ovoviparous, it takes a little bit more time for those offspring to be ready, right? You got to keep those eggs internally you probably can't make nearly as many offspring so you put a little bit more energy into your offspring so now it's it's quality over quantity to some extent pupiparous on the other hand they've got to feed those larvae internally somehow and i'll give you some examples later in the semester of flies that will do that they actually feed those larvae internally through what are considered milk glands neat so these put a lot of effort into that single larvae because you can't really support 100 or 300 larvae internally, right? That would be a miracle. So these uh, pupiferous larvae are usually laid down singly at a time. So these females are nourishing one single offspring at a time. So really high quality over quantity there. So there's some advantages and disadvantages to each of these ways that these um, flies have evolved. Now, the females will lay a varying number of offspring, just depending on the species. So think about it really quickly. What do you think uh, of these oviparous, larviparous, or pupiparous organisms, which one do you think will lay the most offspring? It's going to be the oviparous, right? Less amount of time and energy into those offspring. <clears throat> so they can lay this varying number so the oviparous will produce more offspring sort of all at once than those that are larviparous or pupiparous okay so they just quantity over quality in that case 
Now, many dipteran species will inhabit aquatic or semi-aquatic environments during their immature stages. So you find a lot of these eggs or a lot of these larvae either underwater or near uh, gooey things. So we have uh, organisms that will lay their eggs on the surface of water, on the banks of streams, rivers, or in puddles. We have organisms that will lay their eggs in decomposing matter, either vegetable matter or animal matter. They'll lay their eggs in sewers, in drains, in uh, fecal matter. So they, they have this ability to handle these aquatic or semi-aquatic organ or environments before they hatch or before they uh, get into the adult stage. And the number of larval instars, that varies with the species. In general, a diptera will have three or four larval instars. There are a couple that are a little different, but for the most part, we see three or four larval instars before pupation. Now, let's look at the general rule of thumb of these instars and these pupa. In general, Brachycerin larvae have three larval instars. Remember, Brachycerin larvae are the ones that look like houseflies or blowflies. So they have three larval instars, instar one, two, and three. Nematocerin larvae have four larval instars. Now I say in general, because every once in a while there's a single species that comes in and just screws up the whole thing. But in general, Brachycera is three larval instars. Nematocera is four larval instars. You can usually determine the larval instar of a Brachycerin species morphologically. So you can look at that Brachycerin species and determine which larval instar it is. So look over on the left here, and I'm showing you the posterior sphericals of the Brachycerin larvae. And now this happens to be a blowfly. Depending on the species, they have uh, posterior sphericals that look a little bit different, but this gives you a general overall view. The first instar generally, generally lacks anterior sphericals in the larvae, so you don't have any anterior sphericals, and then they have um, some number of slits in the posterior sphericals, usually only one. Okay, so no anterior uh, sphericals and a single sphericular slit in the posterior sphericle. The second and third instars, they bear anterior sphericals, so they both have those anterior sphericals. They get them during that, that first molt out of the first instar. And then they have two or three sphericular slits, depending on their instar. So the second instar larvae has two sphericular slits, and the third instar larvae has three. That makes it really easy, right? First instar one, second instar two third instar, three. So it's super easy to tell Brachycera. So when you're in lab and you're looking at the Brachycera larvae, look at their posterior sphericals. You should be able to tell which instar they are in. The Nematocerin larvae, uh, they're a bit harder to tell apart. We have to look at them by size. So let's look at the type specimen, the mosquito for Nematocera. These are generally recognized in their different four instars simply by size. So the first instar uh, mosquito larvae, they're somewhere between 0.5 to 1.5 millimeters long. So they're very tiny. So look at this picture right in the middle there, that tiniest one right there, that's your first instar larvae. The second instar larvae get bigger. They're somewhere between 1.5 and 2.5 millimeters in length. The third instars are between 2.5 and 3.5 millimeters. And fourth instars are the largest. So they're above 3.5 millimeters long. Okay, so it's basically a size based for this. Now, there are certain species that have other morphological characteristics that can differentiate these different uh, larvae, but you'll get to know those as you get to know the different species. Rule of thumb, you're looking at size. Now, there's also a significant difference between the pupae of the two groups of Brachycera and Nematocera. The pupae of Nematocera are what we call obtect, meaning you can see the appendages and other external bodily structures on the outside of the pupil casing. So if you look at an obtect pupil casing, you can see wings or you can see legs and mouth parts and things on the outside. Okay, so look at that mosquito pupae right in the uh, center top there. So you can see various appendages. There it is. Okay, so that's called obtect. Now, the brachycin larvae are coarctate, meaning that they develop inside a smooth 
casing. This smooth casing is derived from the sclerotized exoskeleton of the last larval instar. So the things on the outside of the Brachycerin pupil casing all have to do with the larvae. So you can see the uh, spheracular slits, say, or the, the posterior sphericals on that pupil casing. You can see the ridges that denote the different segments of the larvae, but you can't see legs. You can't see adult mouth parts. You can't see anything like that. So coarctate means that they are fully encased with no appendages or other adult features visible on the outside of the casing. Instead, you see the larvae characteristics on that pupil casing. All right, so that's some basic morphology and reproduction of these two different groups. Let me know if you have any questions.